Hello everybody! Welcome to a Paracosm Cinematic Adventure! And I'm gonna walk away from the copyrighted music that's playing in the car. Tonight, I'm going to see Suicide Squad. Despite some reviews that it isn't very good, I mean most reviews, I still want to see the movie and find out for myself. So, I'm waiting for some friends to meet me, and then I'm gonna go in. So for a little background on my movie knowledge, I did go to school at UCF for a year as a film pending major. It's really hard to get into that film school. Nigh impossible. So I came back home or whatever, but I always continue to love for the motion pictures. For years and years I've tried to write a script and I had ideas, I didn't want to be an animator, I wanted to be a comic book artist at one point, but I always had a love for the story. Over the years I was always a frustrated screenwriter slash storyteller slash wannabe film director. But a couple years ago, my friend turned me on a book called Save the Cat, which has, a, it's a formula, but not really for writing scripts. It's not that scripts, there's no formula you're just gonna input stuff in and just write a script. Some people might think that, but that'll never work. It'll never make a good film. Although, what happens is Hollywood gets obsessed with this formula and tries to run with it. That being said, it's for the first time of all the books I've ever read, it kind of unlocked something in me. Because what always happened was, I'd have these ideas, and I'd get frustrated part of the way through, and never finish it. Therefore, when I read this, it was like, and just the way the guy wrote it, and they explain stuff based on different movies, or whatever, it makes you understand how there's certain things in every story, like certain, like, 13 minutes in or so, there's an inciting incident. In that, I was able to organize my ideas for the first time. So finally, I wrote a script. Me and my friend Jeremy worked on it, plotted out a bunch of ideas, and I finally finished it. It took a long time because it was a lot of work. It took me two years from start to finish. And actually, I had an idea. It started out as a it was November National Writing Month. I actually started writing the script idea after we got back from Disney one time. And I went from there. And like the idea just sat with me. I just kept on jotting down ideas, jotting down ideas, jotting down ideas. So eventually, what became Blood Orange came out. The best way to describe it is it's LA Confidential meets Lethal Weapon and takes place in and around the theme parks in Orlando. And includes, much like James Elroy wrote LA Confidential, some real life inspired moments. Another version of it to describe it is it's based around a Boston cop who's moved to Orlando for a mysterious reason. I don't want to spoil that yet. But then he's partnered, as often as the case, with a more straight-laced cop, because the Boston cops, you know, shoot from the hip, swears a lot, etc. And the uh, other guys are more detailed-oriented. And he's Latino, and uh, you know, from that area, and the gangs and everything. Basically, there's a, as a, often with film noir, which it is, which actually doesn't sell that well, so it's kind of reason probably why it's never going to sell. It's basically one case leads to a bigger thing and it's again around the theme park world. So after finishing the script I submitted it to the Screencraft. Is this Screencraft? So it's Blake Snyder wrote Save the Cat. I can't believe I couldn't remember that name. And it is a Screencraft contest. It was the action adventure uh, contest I entered in. And I actually with my first screenplay was a semi-finalist. Which I think is kind of cool. But then I entered it in uh, on the Blacklist website and tried some other things, but got no traction. And obviously you see that in the summer on The Nice Guys, which is a film noir, written by Shane Black, who wrote the Lethal Weapon movies, and directed by him in Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, also a film noir movie that made no money. There really isn't a market for that. So I'm thinking about retooling it as a TV pilot script to maybe get a job doing it on maybe the show gets picked up it, it, you know it could happen but most likely just to get a job writing television but then will the flocks go away <gasps> I, I don't know could I do both I would hope so the main reason I said this and tell this story besides I think it's somewhat interesting that based on my success minimal non-selling as a screenwriter that I might have any some idea about stories and my opinion should matter a little bit when it comes to movies. So therefore, 
after I see Suicide Squad, I will do a mini review and tell you guys what I actually think. So, what did I think of Suicide Squad? I would tell you, but there's copyrighted music playing in the background, and if I don't stop talking, I think there might be copyright issues. So I might wait until I get to the car. Suicide Squad figures. So Suicide Squad, way more fun than Batman v Superman. But a narrative mess. This is what happens when you film it with only six weeks of script writing ahead of time. Go watch Chris Stuckman's review of it. Probably should put the link below. But he nails it in terms of it feels like there's way too there's way too much backstory involved. Way too much. They spend way too much time establishing characters' backstories. It's not like in Guardians of the Galaxy, where they definitely just like you just meet the characters and then they kind of like hint at stuff in the backstory. You don't have to need to know everything, and they spend a lot of time, especially on Harley Quinn and Deadshot. Like with flashbacks in the beginning of the film, it takes a while to get going. Remember, I was talking about the inciting incident. The inciting incident never really happens. They kind of just like form. It's like it's more like there could be weapons of mass destruction, meta humans that are evil, and therefore we have to form a team. But they never try getting the good team together first. So. I like the characters. And that's important. And it is fun at times, but some of the fun moments don't really matter. Like, you you probably cut a half an hour out of that film and just get to the point. That's what I'm trying to say. So I don't hate it. But there's a better movie there. Kaylee's car shopping, just like us. So I'm not saying don't see it in Suicide Squad, but no. It's a product of not having enough time to make the movie. And I don't know if you heard, they actually had the director cutting his cut while the trailer company that cut the trailer doing a separate cut to try to make it more fun. And then they went back and reshot a bunch of scenes to get the movie more like the trailer. I've never heard of that before. So, like, unlike with Star Wars, J.J. Abrams was like, we need more time, and Kathleen Kennedy's like, all right, we'll give you six months. I think this movie needed six more months. Go see it if you like those characters, but don't expect a great movie. Now, time to get some pizza. There's actually another location from the movie The Way Way Back, Steve Carell. Right around there is a little rotary where Steve Carell and his family first arrived in town. And Sam Rockwell drives by, crossing by, because they work at the nearby water park. I'm actually up there watching them film that day. And Steve Carell was there, surrounded by a ton of people. So many, in fact, I could only get near him. I did not get to say hello. Cars. Are you with your finger? Hello, Billy. Hello, Billy. Oh, wait, here comes another one. Hello, Billy. Hello, Billy. Up here, look oh, at all the babies. On. Oh, my goodness. Here's a herd of sheep. Goats. Wait, no. Goats. <laughs> <laughs> what do you call a group of goats? You can call them a herd, tribe, flock. How many goats are in that? building there. They keep multiplying. Daddy. Oh, hey. Hey, Billy. <laughs> How did he get up there? How did that guy get up there, Billy? Get way up there. It's crazy. Can he jump? You're not talking? The goats stick together. That's why you don't have, you know, when somebody sings, talks to the pigs, it's never a goat. 
Oh, a little Billy. I never noticed that sign before. It's kind of cool. Kaylee, show me your ninja skills. Ooh. You are ninja. I'm a bad guy. I do die. Kaylee. Yeah, you are a good guy. Like Remember, a ninja's greatest weapon is the shadows. Your skills are very advanced. I'm gonna get hit in the face, you know that. Oh, oh, it's not even bad. You got cute faces. Can you miss that? Did you try to stab daddy? You are those, you need to. No, you need to. I need those, okay. You look adorable. Patience killing me. What is it? Oh. What is it? Ghost. Show it to me, Ninja. <laughs> the claw. It like enhances see? the eyes. Who are you? Ninja. A ninja. Your best weapon is the shadows. Kill something. You want them out? Yeah. Show me your ninja skills. Oh my goodness. Wow. We're all in trouble now. Wow. That was amazing. Oh my goodness, Kaylee. Where did you learn these natural ninja skills? Yes, there I got my noises. I will not mess with you. Hi, Rita! Oh, Rita! <laughs> A little ninja in training, be careful. Oh, so let's talk spoilers about that film, Suicide Squad. I just rewatched Guardians of the Galaxy, and it got me thinking. There's a movie that was launched without any solo films beforehand, and what that film has is that you meet Peter Quill early, and then you get right as an adult in an adventure, and then we start to meet the rest of the guys or girls, the characters, as the film goes. The brilliance of that is they slowly doll out backstory. Then we find out that Drax, you know, family was killed. Rocket, when he gets drunk, reveals that he was cybernetically, or you know, worked on. And then Groot, we really don't ever find out about Groot, because that's probably going to be for the next film. Suicide Squad spends a lot of time showing a lot of backstory and characters. And I'm sure as snippets it's interesting, in moments, but as a film, that's why it doesn't work. You need to get to the story itself. Guardians, you meet that, he, he's going for the, the ball that has the Infinity Stone in it, and then you quickly find out you meet the bad guy, and that now he wants it, and now he's, you know, everybody's coming after Quill and wants the Infinity Stone, and that's what propels the story. What I would do differently on Suicide Squad, I would have had them, something happened in the beginning, the part when Deadshot gets captured, and maybe you show Harley Quinn getting captured. And then you cut to the jail where they all are in Louisiana. And then we get introduced to all the characters and then something has happened early in this film. Maybe the somebody discovers the brother of the Enchantress. Was it Incubus? I think it was Incubus. And then he, that's a thing they have to go after and then as they go on that first mission that they're sent into, not until halfway through the film, because normally what happens is you're introduced to the story and then once the characters get together, about 20 something minutes into the film, the first act ends, and then you get the second half of the, 
movie, you know, the middle act. And then the first half of that is what's called Fun and Games, another Blake Snyder thing. But basically it's when the promise of the premise, the characters are together and you're having the fun with it. But then about midway through the film, something happens that makes things go bad. And in this case it would have been the Enchantress would go bad. So she probably kind of does in this movie, but it, there is no threat before she becomes the threat. So it's kind of manufactured. So this should have been a threat that led to, and then when she t turned, when she encounters the, what do you call it? Would it have been a coincidence? Probably, but would it have been a cool coincidence? Yes. The film just spends way too much time telling us about backstories that we don't need to know. It should just be like Hollywood, you know, something happened with the Joker, and the Joker has a thing. That backstory can stay for a later part the movie to be revealed. We don't need all their backstories. And that, because then once she becomes evil, or a full on enchantress, and that whole thing with the, the heart of her, like that thing kind of ends pretty quickly. And Katana, what is she doing there with. You can literally, you know, it's a cool part she's talking to the sword, but if you exercise her out of the film, exercise, excise her out of the film, and cut her out altogether, it doesn't change anything. It's more like a threat that goes nowhere. I just think it feels like a movie that, again, the director had good ideas, but was kind of rushed into it. Yeah, getting there. So anyways, I'm probably rambling, but it's a weird movie because the characters deserve a better story. That's what I'm saying. It's not like they weren't good to the characters, except some of it was not enough for certain people to do. And I guess it's an example of how hard it is to do a team picture. But I don't know why they felt they had to cram everything in. It's just my thoughts, as I established last night, on narrative and whatnot. But, uh, I'm going to finish cooking and end this vlog. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, like, comment, and we'll talk about the movie if you want. I'm always game to talk about it. Unless people say crazy stuff. By the way, Rotten Tomatoes is owned 30% by Warner Brothers, so don't sign that petition. That's a cut.